I'm Doug Arendt um, out of the National Renewable Energy Lab, and one might ask a question, why are we here? Uh, so um, NREL has been involved in the clean energy space for about 40 years, um, really focused on inventing technologies and accelerating their use in the markets. We have also been involved in development and clean energy for development for those 40 years. Even myself at the beginning of my career back in the mid-90s at NREL, I was involved in clean energy for development in South Africa, India, Nepal, um, Philippines, many other places when technology costs actually were much more expensive and uh, the solutions were difficult. Uh, and we didn't know nearly as much as today. So that, that's a bit of history in terms of why the partnership with you and you wider, and I think that that's important uh, to really understand is that we're, we also are very focused on this interplay between technology policy uh, and the markets themselves. Um, so let me um, just spend a couple minutes with some comments and then we'll, we'll blend in. Um, let me step back up and kind of uh, provide some context to, to lead on from where Channing provided some uh, introductory framing for why the book and then where do we need to go. And, and he mentioned that we're, we're essentially, at least we, we hypothesize that we're, we're entering a new era. And I think that actually that, that's actually quite significant is that for the past many decades, um, we have approached uh, climate and development from a top-down perspective, particularly from an international aspect. Technologies have matured over that period of time so that clean energy technologies today actually, without subsidies in many parts of the world, are the least cost option for, for, for providing clean energy, to, for providing energy today, generally. And that's without accounting for public health externalities, climate change externalities, et cetera. Um, and it includes the grid integration cost of providing electricity. So now you can think of clean electricity and then electrification of end use services as really a very viable option going forward, even if you don't solve the subsidy issue and the carbon issue and the public health issue at the front end of it in many, many different locations. So the paradigm has changed considerably. And then we add into it, I'll call it the, what Channing called the bottoms up uh, solution, which has come forward from Paris, which is the nationally determined contributions. And this poses both an opportunity and I think a very interesting development um, complexity that we should think about and have a conversation about, which is that one of the dynamics introduced by the NDCs is that the, is that the NDCs reflect local priorities in a global context. So they were at, countries were asked to contribute their plans for addressing climate change. But those plans, by necessity, reflect local priorities of how those countries want to address their energy and related problems. So case in point, China, Southern Africa, even the US. China is dealing dramatically with air quality issues. It's also dealing with a very, very complex, uh, I'll call it local political uh, dynamic. And so they want to address air pollution and therefore uh, some political stability uh, issues that go with that. Of course, their healthcare issues and their production issues, their productivity issues, sorry. They also want to address uh, internally uh, macroeconomic changes in terms of the structure of the economy. And they're seeing clean energy as it's been codified in their NDC as a mechanism to invest in innovation and to address air quality issues and they contribute that uh, domestically driven um, set of priorities into the global context. So it's a very, very important um, piece to understand. So this second phase has um, four attributes to it that I, I wanna talk about, um, which are very important to think about. One is the realization of the nationally determined contributions. So this is very important. So were they, for example, political aspirations, or are they, in fact, 
uh, realistic expectations and those to be implemented? I think this is a, a vexing question uh, that we, we all uh, need to pay attention to. And on the technical assistance support side is how do we provide the data, the tools, the information, the lessons learned to those countries, to all countries, and share those in a very different environment to have actually support those countries realizing their nationally determined contributions. That goes with all of the experimentation that Channing talked about before. We're gonna see a whole new plethora of policy regulatory experiments coming forward. That's gonna need, uh, I'll call it some measurement and verification from the academic community, some learning, some sharing of practices uh, in, the, in the conversations I'm involved with, which uh, span from Africa to India to Mexico to South Africa and beyond. There is an intense desire to learn very quickly from other people's experiments, other countries' experiments, and, uh, and figure out how to adapt those into implementation locally, and I think that's very important. There's a third element, which is how do we uh, continue to uh, the conversation around deeper decarbonization? So if you remember the words of Paris, they were uh, a goal of stabilization at 2.5 and an aspiration uh, to achieve 1.5 degrees or more. What that means in the energy world and what that means in greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide, but all greenhouse gases, is essentially moving to a zero carbon system and potentially to a negative emission system, i.e. net negative emissions, by mid-century. That is an enormous change in our energy system in 35 years or less than 35 years. What that means is that we all have to run faster, do more, it's speed and scale of change of that energy system. It also means that carbon emissions have to peak relatively quickly. What that means is preferably by 2030 or before because the one, the carbon budget gets saturated, which means you have to go deeper in negative emissions if you continue to um, go beyond the, the limits. Uh, and then two, uh, the problem gets even harder going forward. So that's a, that's a third element. The fourth is, of course, this innovation uh, uh, cycle. And um, Shoru talked about that. We can talk more about that um, as we go forward. There are some attributes then that in this second phase we also have to think about, and I'll just go through these very quickly. One is there is a much deeper awareness of the complexity of trade-offs. And here I'm just gonna throw out the buzz nexus because I wrote about it in the IPCC assessment report AR5, but many people are aware of it now. It's really difficult to introduce it into a policy environment and policy decisions, but it is the nexus of energy, land, food, water, development, land use, and climate change all together. And it, is, it deserves academic rigor and attention, and it also deserves, frankly, the simplistic framing for a policymaker to understand all the pieces on their, their chessboard and how do they balance among those to find what I'll define and what, what we talk about a little bit in the, in the, in the academic community of climate-resilient pathways. So resiliency there means something very different. We can get into that in the, in the Q&A. The geopolitical aspects are also complex between local, regional, and global. That's really important. And then innovation policies are pervasive. And they need to be thought about across developed and developing countries. There is a lot of room for innovation um, ecosystems, shall I call that, and new, new solutions. In the developing countries, we can talk about some examples where this combination, for example, or Cheryl talked about IT and energy, uh, you know, thinking about cell phone services and thinking about how do you provide payment and, and surety services and things like that, even to rural villages that comes through uh, very, very opportunistically as, as, a, as a real solution, particularly on the development side. And that's not just for electricity, but it's for electricity for water pumping and purification, which leads to agriculture, leads to development, 
And the electricity also goes into healthcare, it goes into education, et cetera, on that whole front. So where does this all lead? Let me just um, articulate very quickly uh, four areas of continued research. So I'm gonna be very kind of focused on the academic side as we lead into a conversation. Uh, and they are just very quickly. So clean energy innovation, um, there was a, a comparable annou announcement in Paris by the leaders of 20 um, uh, countries called Mission Innovation. Not sure if you are aware of that one. That was them committing to doubling their clean energy R&D. And that was clean energy as defined by that country. So Saudi Arabia is probably gonna invest pretty considerably in carbon capture and storage. Other countries may consider nuclear clean and therefore they will invest in that. Others will only do uh, typically what we would call the, the new renewables technologies, which aren't any new anymore. That's the wind and solar, et cetera. There's that, there was a comparable uh, kind of more uh, splashy announcement by a number of uh, billionaires uh, who created what was called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, multiple billions of dollars of theirs on the table to invest in, again, breakthrough technologies uh, that would be clean and help address climate change going forward. The, the sec second piece is really understanding this resiliency pathway and the nexus across energy, food, land, water, climate change, et cetera. Um, that's really important. And so there has been an argument in the IPCC to actually merge working groups two and, th and uh, uh, two and three. So uh, one is the, the science, two was impacts and three was mitigation. Impacts is evolving into impacts plus adaptation and three is mitigation. And there has been an argument, it, it didn't go forward for the next assessment report, which is how do we think about holistically climate resilient pathways, which include the, the aggressive mitigation that's required to meet the temperature targets or stabilization targets, clean change targets. And for those appropriate places, how do they, how do, they do that in an adaptive way that's resilient to the frankly, the embedded change which is already in the system. So I think that's really important. Um, the third area is understanding the complexities from individuals through social networks to institutions to global impacts. And here I'll tell you just a little bit of, of, a, of a couple of research stories, if I can take a minute on that, because my team at, at NREL has actually done some really interesting new research on informing individual consumer choice. And this is individual, it's you going to the grocery store or you buying products online or buying a service online and things like that. And it turns out that if you actually provide people credible objective information at the point of decision making via your cell phone, via an app, via a screen shot uh, coming up on your computer, let's say you're on a, on a purchasing site like uh, a, a Amazon or someplace else, if you actually had that information and you're conscious of it, you would actually, at least our research shows that the majority of people, so more than 50%, would make more environmentally conscious decisions. But the companies don't provide that. And so there's a, and some interesting insights in terms of how do you just take advantage of big data, good information, inform individual decisions, but use the I'll call it the, the business ecosystem actually to affect change, which just isn't the companies doing their own social responsibility. It's actually interacting with consumers. So that's from individual all the way to global. And the fourth is how to inform decisions better and faster. And here it really comes back into the core research of economics, the core research of decision-making models, tools, big data, and providing that ubiquitously across the world at speed and at scale. And this is a, a really deep need to getting the right tools to the right decision makers in the right fidelity without overwhelming them with a bunch of detail when they don't understand you know, the, 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 core, the, the technical details underneath it, but synthesizing that into the decision making levels that's, that's there. So that's the pathway forward in terms of research, uh, in terms of really uh, opportunities, I think, to, to take this forward. And I, I, maybe I'll just transition then into a couple of questions and I'll maybe throw them back uh, to, to my co-panelists, but also open them all to you. 
and I've got three, but I'll start with the first one, which is, do you see and, and do you have ideas about how do we collectively, or how should we, let maybe, maybe more academically, address the complexities which are introduced between local and global? And this could be everything from distributed gen to the bulk system, or it could be between how do I solve problems in Malawi versus Africa, and why should Malawi care about a global issue when it's still working about its own development? And that's really open to you all as well to share stories and examples, but maybe I'll turn to, to you three and you can start a couple of thoughts. Okay. <laughs> 